Hello and welcome to the Big Picture. I am Tina Jha. Moving ahead with its plans to make e-commerce processes open source and also to curb digital monopolies, the government on Monday appointed an advisory council to design and accelerate the adoption of open network for digital commerce. The nine-member panel includes National Health Authority CEO R S Sharma, Infosys non-executive chairman Nandan Nilkani, Quality Council of India chairman Adil Zainul Bhai. co-founder and head of Digital India Foundation Arvind Gupta and MD and CEO of National Payments Corporation of India Dilip Aspe among others now through the open network for digital commerce that's the ONDC the government is looking to standardize protocols for onboarding stakeholders such as the sellers on the e-marketplaces currently different e-marketplaces have different set of rules which at times makes it difficult for small traders and the suppliers to adopt The move by the government is the latest in a series of changes announced or being planned to be rolled out by the government for the e-commerce sector. What are the other changes that the open network for digital commerce will bring about? What are its larger aims and objectives? How significant a move it is towards streamlining the country's e-commerce ecosystem and will it end the monopoly of the larger e-commerce companies? These are some of the aspects that we will discuss and analyze on the big picture today with two eminent panelists. I'm pleased to welcome on the program today Ms. Surabhi Agarwal, Senior Assistant Editor, The Economic Times, and Mr. Arvind Gupta. He is head and co-founder of the Digital India Foundation, and he is also a member of the government-appointed panel that will suggest measures to design an open network for digital commerce. Thank you to both my guests for joining me on this edition of the Big Picture. Surabhi Agarwal, let me begin the program today with you. Firstly, help us and our viewers understand what exactly is open network for digital commerce and the significance of making the e-commerce ecosystem open source. Thanks for uh, having me on the show, show. First of all, so if I could just tell you a little bit about uh, this entire uh, program, it was launched. by the government in 2020 and it's the project which uh, basically aims to provide a sort of a uh, open network for sellers as well as companies to co- do digital commerce if you right now look at the entire commerce industry it is sort of controlled by a few large e-commerce companies as well as uh, retailers and we have uh, small uh, and uh, medium players basically trying uh, to adopt to different norms by these different companies what the government is trying to do is it's trying to build a sort of a aadhar or a upi kind of an infrastructure when it comes to uh, e-commerce now too many details are not available right now in terms of what the idea behind is but whatever has been discussed so far in the public forum this is mm-hmm. what it seems like uh, as if the idea behind the project is to have a, a sort of a upi kind of an open framework which will allow people to build uh, apps and build uh, platforms which which are open standard which are sort of stand which have common standards for everybody and which will kind of give a play a uh, level playing field to all the stakeholders not just the big companies or uh, the big retailers so uh, i think this is just trying to democratize uh, the entire industry through the use of technology okay so uh, uh, the purpose basically is to streamline the existing structure as well and standardize procedures Uh, Mr Gupta coming to you first of all congratulations on being appointed as a member of this government advisory committee and also if you could give us a sense of the larger role and responsibility of this advisory panel in accelerating the adoption of ONDC So uh Tina uh, thank you for having me I want to comment on my in my capacity as a as a digital economist as a digital observer as a technocrat and not as a member of the panel because the discussions of the panel probably are uh, uh you know they will be made public as and when they happen so um i i am not the official spokesperson of the panel so i want to put that caveat uh, um uh, before i start uh, discussing this topic because the topic is relevant now what what this is doing is uh, what the government's intention is that's that's first understand and what india's intention is uh surbi did give a, a you know a, a little example let's take a few things there are um, and this is my uh, as a professor i can you know also i can explain to you to your viewers to our viewers here what is the need for building public platforms uh there are about nine platforms in the world which are a billion user plus platforms 
Five of them come from the US, four come from China. They're all private platforms. India is the only country which has built what is called the Aadhaar stack um, around Aadhaar, around UPI, around DigiLocker, um, the Jam Trinity as a public platform. What is a public platform, first of all? A public platform is something that is built around the concept of standards, openness, and, uh, and trust of the backing of, of the government and not, uh, not, um, not operated by the whims and fancies of a few private players. Uh, so that's number one. So what India has done is, number one, very appreciable as a country. Uh, we build the world's biggest public digital platform. Now, this is we, we so far had a concept that roads are public uh, utility, public goods, um, trains are public goods. Um, India broke that and leapfrogged into the fourth industrial revolution by saying digital can also be a public good. So we created this public good in uh, as I said, identity in payments and in, in, in you know in uh, KYC and and a lot of other things. What did it achieve? Uh, and let me give you a use case. What did it achieve? UPI, which everybody is so fond of, uh, today is not only uh, doing 2.6 billion transactions a month, but has created and has broken the cardinal rule of two and created a rule of three. So the the duopoly that existed. Uh, in payments and payment settlements uh, by two big uh, international operators, India created a third operator. And, and guess what? It's controlled by us, not by anybody else. So, so we, have, we have done this. We have created. And it's, 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 it's not stifled innovation, but created a lot more startups and innovation around it. We have better control on data. We have, uh, because it's an open system, um, you know, Tens, tens of unicorns around just UPI have been created. Unicorns. I mean, this is this are uh, this is a great value creation. Probably 200, 300 billion dollars of value is getting created as we talk, mm-hmm. and it's going to reach a trillion dollars uh, of value because of Aadhaar stack. Now, coming to coming to e-commerce, which is also controlled by maybe two or three companies, and e-commerce is just not uh, to me this uh, digital platforms for transactions. Uh, are not just selling, buying, and selling of goods. That's one category. It could be mobility. It could be food. Um, it could be anything where a transaction takes place. Uh, and if you see, including in India, uh, only a few, two or three platforms control that market. Is there a need? The government feels there is a need to make it more, more level playing field, um, uh, to make it more open, to create innovation and a, a ecosystem, really, and not have closed platforms, but a network which is open so that more people can, can come participate, innovate, and, and we can prevent, um, uh, you know, uh, monopolies to take place. So, uh, and, and the government is playing a very constructive role by taking, uh, a, a, you know, a, a very uh, proactive step of uh, uh, thinking ahead. How can we create platforms which... Uh, which then are public property and not private property. So okay. I think that's the approach. Uh, and, uh, given that, I think it's a very, very welcome step. Okay, Surabhi. So as bo- bo- both of you are pointing out, towards creating this level playing field, how is the ONDC going to impact the larger e-commerce companies? How problematic is it going to be for them? And also in terms of beneficiary, if, if beneficial, if, if we talk about how beneficial is it going to be for the smaller online retailers, the new entrants into this marketplace? So, that's a very interesting question because, uh, you know, I, I think uh, no, any government has done this so far. I mean, we know that everybody, all the governments, be it the US or be it the European Union or Russia or Australia, everybody has been struggling right now how to control big tech. But when it comes to creating an open platform, uh, for specifically commerce, I don't think any country has taken a lead. So like uh, Arvind said that uh, the Indian government is proactively taking a step towards this, that's a very welcome move. But it also kind of opens a whole lot of new challenges, uh, spe- especially, uh, especially for companies like Amazon and uh, you know Walmart-controlled Flipkart, which are the two largest players in the Indian e-commerce uh, market, as well as you know others like uh, Uber and Zomato and uh, you know, which are which are largely uh, funded by foreign money. So we have to see that you know how these companies will sort of 
take onto the uh, norms or the standards which are prescribed by the panel and if at all uh, you know adopted by the government of india but like arvin said it is a very very welcome step because uh, right now the market is controlled by a few players and there are multiple uh, concerns like i would like to point uh, towards a recent uh, uh, study by rbi where they said that uh, big tech companies should not be allowed to uh, enter into financial services because it poses a lot of challenges and the issues that they listed include from data privacy to cyber security to monopolistic practices to antitrust issues now these are some of the broad uh, uh, issues or challenges which are coming across in all areas not just uh, e-commerce right so this is what i think the government is trying to address through this move as well as a series of other moves that uh, or policy measures that they have been Uh, taking in the recent past, uh, if you can look at if you look at the recent intermediary guidelines uh, on which there's a lot of controversy recently, given the stand of Twitter and others, I think that's what the government is trying to do. They are trying to figure out that how do we control, uh, uh, not really control, but make these platforms more accountable to the users, and also figure out a way uh, to address the issues of say data monopoly because these platforms control a lot of data, and India being Uh, one of the largest uh, data markets of the world we have almost what 700 million internet users now that's that's uh, a lot of users uh, sharing a lot of data which is again in the hands of these few, few players so there has to be a way uh, to make sure that these uh, companies don't end up becoming monopolies they don't hu- uh, hurt startups they don't hurt small businesses and these are questions which are being asked not just in india but globally Okay, so Mr. Gupta, uh, towards uh, curbing digital monopolies, as both of you have rightly said, it is indeed a big step. But in terms of, uh, uh, say, towards the efforts that are being made by the government to accelerate the adoption of the ONDC that we are talking about, do you see any potential challenges on the way? Um, uh, Tina, was that question to me? Yes, yes, Mr. Gupta. about the problems the potential challenges that you could face in terms of adoption of ondc see the uh, the let me just start with a little historical thing when upi was rolled out and in india has the the best history of rolling out public platforms upi was rolled out about 4 years 5 years ago uh, and this is pre demonetization even uh, people didn't believe that this would succeed at all uh but when you when you see openness when you see startups and everybody starting working together today from 300 100000 transactions i remember in october 2016 in four and a half five years we are doing 2.2.8 2. billion transactions a month that's that's a, i mean that factor is amazingly high you can't even imagine how high it is adoption happens when it, 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 it uh, consumers are presented with a choice uh they're not restricted there is price parity i and, and uh, there is uh, and and you know the innovators then are making products in india which are uh, which are very easy to use very simple to use so that's that's where innovation happens uh and adoption will come automatically the second thing i want to share is then then you know you see the the national digital health stack that is being built as we roll out uh, as we talk and uh, a part of it has been rolled out in aragya setu and in coven but uh, you know today uh, how many how many uh, apps integrated uh, with the open apis of both coven and aragya setu automatically uh, so if upi the adoption in the first few days was let's say 30% uh, in the national health stack uh, it automatically went up to 70 80% because now people have the trust that the government can deliver and deliver uh, the platform it's um, it's both technical architecture is robust and it stands it's sustainable and the government will back it through um uh, and it's not a fly by night operation so the when it comes to this digital commerce or any new platform the government is building it comes with that credibility that trust and a brand new approach it's a it's a white sheet approach it's not that we are we are fixing a broken problem the, we are probably fixing the broken problems of policy and uh, some other issues but not really of technology it's building ground up and when you are building ground up uh you know the scale and the speed is very very big so um i think uh the challenges uh, and you know of course any, every technology every business roll out has its own challenges nobody can um 
I, at least I am not the, the expert who can foresee all challenges. We can foresee a few challenges that have happened from our past experience, but they will be surmounted as you go along. Um, and that's where agile policy making and a, and a team, which is led by people who have um, built large scale platforms, uh, really helps. Okay, so Ravi, so what recently what we uh, we we've seen is that the government and the e-commerce firms have been at loggerheads over the draft e-commerce policy for consumer protection that was released uh, by the ministry. Going forward, could the adoption of ONDC also witness some kind of unease among these retailers? I would believe so, uh, Tina, because, uh, you know, like uh, Mr. Arvind Gupta said, that every new uh, sort of, uh, you know, effort by the government does see some resistance, but uh, specifically something like this, because, uh, you know, right now, uh, globally, uh, the e-commerce industry is such that uh, large companies, be it Amazon or Walmart or others, they sort of control the ecosystem when it comes to uh, their own platforms. And now they are, they are uh, private businesses and, you know, they can argue that uh, we will follow our own norms. Uh, if the government tries to tell them that, no, uh, these are standards, uh, policies that you have to up, that every platform has to apply when it comes to say how will you onboard sellers or how will you how much discounting can you give or for example how many uh, sales can you have in a year these are just uh, these are just uh, sort of examples that i'm giving uh, for the uh, for the listeners or uh, the viewers to understand that what could be the possible uh, outcomes of this uh, uh, this panel right so now when it comes to these kind of mandates or dictates from the government there is bound to be unease among the companies which which might uh, question and say that, uh, you know, we are private businesses uh, run by our own policies. Uh, we are dictated by uh, uh, by commerce, by, by profit and loss. So uh, we have the choice either to follow it or not, right? So I would suggest, uh, I would expect a lot of uh, resistance to this kind of it. But what remains to be seen is how the government goes about uh, you know, this entire process of developing open standards, because like uh, Mr. Gupta said, this is a new area. It is we are starting from uh, sort of a wide sheet. So we don't know what's coming ahead. So I would wait for the government panel to first come up with its recommendations uh, before saying that there's going to be a lot of resistance. Uh, but uh, yes, initial thoughts are that certainly any kind of uh, mandates from the government to these companies on how to run their businesses and how to what kind of policies to have will meet with certain resistance. Okay, Mr. Gupta, so uh, two, two important things that both of you have pointed out, that it's going to create a level playing field that is providing equal opportunities to all the marketplace players. And also to, towards curbing digital monopolies is something that we have already spoken about. What else does the ONDC envision? What are the other kind of changes that it is expected to bring about once it is adopted in terms of redefining the e-commerce landscape in our country? See, I think... Uh... Uh, one of the big things any platform achieves, uh, wants to achieve, which is being built in this public uh, goods approach, is to make sure that the consumer interests, as well as the interests of the sellers, for example, in this case, the retailers, the MSMEs, the, uh, the small shops, the corner shops, are equally protected. So consumer protection, rights protection, as well as uh, uh, you know, uh, enabling the retailers uh, to really disintermediate and get the real right value. Uh, as our prime minister has always said, technology should disintermediate between the buyer and the seller and not really create another gatekeeper. So uh, uh, what platforms like this does is uh, uh, they, they remove the, the really the gatekeeping role and make it more, uh, the networks like this do is everybody can come in and participate. I don't, I don't see, you know, I, and I'll give an example from UPI. Uh, today, who are the two people fighting uh, and really at the front end? Three, three companies actually are international companies who are actually front-ending UPI. One of them is Google. The second is uh, Facebook's WhatsApp. And the third is uh, Walmart's uh, phone pay. So if you think about it, uh, everybody, uh, once they realize that where the consumer is going, they will adopt. And... Um, and same will apply uh, for any such initiatives in the future. Uh, if the consumer sees value in something they're doing, there is less rent seeking. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I think we, uh, we will set the trend. And this trend is going to catch on not only in India. As Surbhi also said, this is something that the world is watching. India, uh, you know, the Prime Minister, for example, yesterday announced uh, Coven to be an open source platform 
for the world. This is again a same similar approach of open sourcing uh, technology for the societal benefit. So uh, if you ask me, that's the that's the big difference. Making technology really benefit society in, at large, which has consumers, sellers, all together working in a win-win situation and not um, creating more gatekeepers. Certainly, and I think uh, the manner in which the e-commerce business has transformed the way business is conducted, it has in our country grown by leaps and bounds. And with also the various initiatives that are being taken from time to time to support its growth in a country. Mr. Gupta, how do you look at the future of the e-commerce industry in our country, particularly uh, in the context of these efforts by the government, which have been undertaken over the past few years, if we look at particularly? See, India, about six, seven years ago, if you take a re, uh, you know, do an assessment, had about 150 million, 15 crore internet users. Today, uh, Surbi, I think we're at about 75 crores, plus or minus. Um, and Tina, uh, I was, uh, Surbi mentioned 70 crores. So I'm just making it 75. And uh, we are the low, lowest scale of cost of data in the world. We, and with the highest per capita data consumption in the world. It's completely transformed. Uh, and what the pandemic has done is uh, we've created a host of new digital migrants who have been, um, you know, forced due to the pandemic to come and start consuming whether education or health or, uh, uh, or uh, financial services all online. Um, so the future is, to you know, as I said, a lot of innovation will happen. A lot of data rich innovation, which is local, a lot of entrepreneurs getting produced a trillion dollar digital economy coming in India in the next uh, three to four years. I, it's not far away. And hundreds of unicorns, uh, which are um, which are being created by Indian entrepreneurs. Um, I, I, I really think that, and, and many areas really remaining to be disrupted. India is really beginning of the bottom of innovation. I've always said the West innovates from top down approach. India innovates from bottom up. And in this there are so many new areas, mobility, transportation, financial services, still credit, um, agriculture, education, um, you know, which are waiting to be even further disrupted. So there is there is going to be a host of, um, uh, you know, uh, exciting times that we will see over the next uh, three to four years. I don't I can't foresee beyond that. Um, and anybody who's tried to foresee beyond that has been proven wrong. So. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I personally believe that the best is yet to come for India in this. We are at the right side, the right vision, the right leadership uh, going into the fourth industrial revolution, not as a laggard, but actually leading. OK, so the future does uh, look bright. Surabhi, how do you look at the road ahead, not just in terms of the growth of the industry, but also in terms of the impact that it is having on the smaller enterprises? So I like to make this, uh, you know, point. You know, I'm sure uh, you know, like you read out the names of the people who are the, who are on the panel, right? So it's a fairly, very, very, very interesting mix. If you uh, look at who uh, who are there on the panel, it's uh, Nandan Nilekani, Arish Sharma. Those are the two people who are sort of credited with building Aadhaar, right? And also, uh, you know, the entire India Stack uh, model is is something that that's been promoted, uh, you know, by the entire Aadhaar ecosystem. Then we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dilip Aspe from N uh, NPCI. Now, uh, if you look at what NPCI is, again, uh, the government is trying to do with NPCI. NPCI was uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the biggest innovator when it comes to uh, fintech industry and what we see in terms of UPI, uh, the IMPS is, is because of NPCI. But the government is also trying to decentralize it by allowing the Googles of the world to come up with their own sort of uh, entities which will come up with different innovations in the fin fintech uh, sector. Companies like Google, uh, Amazon, everybody has applied for what is called a NAU, right? So uh, those are the kind of people who are there on the panel. Of course, Mr. Gupta is there. He he he's led my gaff from the front. He's he has a he has a vast knowledge of you know uh, tech tech industry. So it's a very and then we have uh, people from the retail industry who represent small and medium uh, businesses who have been very vocal about the issues that small sellers face when it comes to fighting off. Uh, the monopoly or the power that rests with companies like Amazon, uh, right? So uh, it's a fairly interesting mix. I'm uh, very uh, curious and I'll be very interested to know that what comes out of it. And this is this will sort of dictate how the industry uh, shapes up. 
Also taking a step back, if I look at some of the key policy measures that India has been dabbling in over the last two, three years, it, it's got to, uh, it's dealing with big tech in a very innovative or in a very interesting uh, fashion. We have uh, a, a committee which is drafting uh, or in, the, in, in a very advanced stages of drafting a, a non-personal data regime, right? Which is again, uh, figuring out ways how to make sure that the data controlled by large companies is shared as a public good, right? Uh, we have, we've seen the re recent intermediary guidelines, which put more and more accountability and responsibility on social media companies, make sure that, you know, they are answerable to users. Uh, they don't end up uh, sort of just uh, keep treating India as a business center. Then we have the data protection law, which is again in the final stages of being passed, which again gives, you know, a set, sets up uh, a nice regime for privacy and also make sure that uh, there is a regulator to look at data issues. So the government is trying uh, to build uh, not just public platforms, but also have these policies which will uh, try to regulate big tech in the, uh, in the country. And these are, like I said before, you know, these are on similar lines with what globally is happening. Countries like US, Europe, Russia, if you've seen recently what is happening in Hong Kong, what is happening in Russia, everybody is trying to figure out a way on how uh, to make sure that uh, you know big tech does not control too much power does not uh, too much power in terms of citizen data uh, how much power they are allowed to uh, have in terms of deciding what goes what does not go on their platforms so everybody is uh, coming up with those policies and i look at this as one of the steps that india is taking uh, to uh, regulate big tech Absolutely. And the best part is that it is going to bring together all of the e-commerce marketplaces on a single network. And this, of course, is going to empower our digital revolution as well. So with that, I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you once again to both my guests for joining me on the program and sharing your thoughts with us and our viewers. Pleasure having you on the show. So that's it from us on The Big Picture today. Thanks very much for your time.